Okay, Dr. Thompson, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, it's a privilege to be here. I appreciate the invitation very much. Uh, reminiscing with Dr. Dale, um, when I was at Cactus Feeders, he invited me up about 18 or 19 years ago uh, when he was just getting this started. So it's pretty humbling to be asked to be with you all this afternoon. And I wish I could say that I've learned a lot between the last time I was here and today about managing high-risk cattle. But one thing that I've learned through the years of starting numerous cutter bowls, working with many feed yards, grow yards, and et cetera, is that the product we start out with dictates a lot of how we're going to manage or what we're going to do with inside the facility. Um, so, so we'll touch on some of that. Um, it's very, one of the things that's exciting about Kansas State University, not only the traditions like Dale Blasey and the Stalker unit, but when you see the familiar faces that come here, um, it is uh, truly an honor to be able to work as a Kansan. So when we go in, and I thought, I'd see I dressed up my slides, Dale, for today's special event, and I'm very, very proud of what you've done. Um, when we have a high death loss issue going on in the feed yard, the first question that pops in my mind, and we have to stop and slow down, is this a morbidity issue or is this a case fatality rate issue? And y'all have heard me say this before, but if it's a morbidity issue, that means the cattle are sick, okay? That we're having an increase in pull rates, which leads to a typical amount of, of projected death loss because as we increase pulls, we'll see an increase in, in death loss for the most part, okay? Now, when I hear people say, well, we got to switch drugs, this drug just quit working, and I wish I had a dollar or five dollars every time I'd heard this, um, is when we have a case fatality rate issue. And a case fatality rate is the number of cattle that I treated that have died divided by the total number of cattle that I've treated, okay? Meaning that within the population that's sick, I will have about five to 10% of the cattle that I treat for bovine respiratory disease will die. My true bias is, is that 10% of cattle that are truly sick with BRD are gonna die regardless of what we treat them with. Um, when I think we over pull and we doctor cattle that aren't sick, which is good, I'd rather pull too deep than, than to, to pull not deep enough. And when I see my case fatality rate get to that 12, 15%, that's when I start saying, okay, what are the problems that are leading to a decreased response to my treatments? So morbidity, I would say probably 90% of the time in the operations I work with, morbidity is the issue. But there are some things that we do management-wise that can influence that, that case fatality rate. And we'll, we'll start in talking about morbidity. The first one's cattle flow. We've listened to a lot of people today, and I wish I would have listened to them uh, before I placed some cattle on feed here a few months ago. Um, <laughs> I wish they would have told me what was coming. This has not been very much fun, um, but it's been good tuition. Um, my wife and I did make, I told her, Dale, I said, if we have an understanding that when I write this check, none of this is coming back, um, we'll probably make it uh, in, in, in our marriage. And she goes, well, why would we do it if we're not going to have any money come back? And I said, I don't know, but bear with me. It's going to be fun. And, um, the, uh, the, the cattle market dictates cattle flow. We'll sit there be painting pipe fences with socks on our hands with nothing to do, cutting weeds, and then that cattle market breaks, or the grass starts to run out, and cattle are coming to the sale barns, and we start buying them. And if we're not careful, we can overwhelm our people and our system because we're 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 working more with the flow of the market. And I understand that that we've talked a lot about getting the lower price coming in and the higher price coming out, but if we do that all the time. Dr. Dan Upson used to tell me, Dan, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken, you know what, poop. And, and, and so when we start to, to flood the system, and I've been through it a lot where we have a rough fall and the next year we all get together and say, okay, doc, now and this is gonna be our only alley we put high risk calves in. When that alley's full, we're shutting the buy off. 
and that lasts a week, okay? And you come in, and when you see cattle that are in the grass traps out by the road, you know the reason why the cattle are in the grass traps out by the road that haven't been processed is because every pen is full because of this. And I can't fix this as a veterinarian, or I can't fix this management-wise if we overwhelm the system um, or this. In weight. As in weight goes up, death loss goes down, okay? Now, the two groups of cattle that kind of screw this up is in these really light Mexicans. They can come in, and they can be really decreased morbidity, mortality, and Holstein calves. But with the Holsteins, I can tell you this. If you buy Holsteins and finish them, first of all, you've got to find somebody to kill them. The second thing is, is that we expect double the death loss for digestive deads with Holsteins versus our colored cattle, okay? But when we're talking about BRD, as we get to that six-weight animal, we start to see that's when it levels off. That's when our death loss levels, levels off. And, and I had a, a friend of mine that's running a grow yard, busier and busier. He's in his 60s, and he's buying four weights. And he goes, oh, this drug quit working. I, just, I said, buy some six weights. And, uh, you know, he's in his 60s with his grandsons, and, they're, and they've got 6,000 head of these four-weight cutter bulls. He bought a bunch of six weights, and he called me up, and he says, I'm bored. There's nothing to do. I said, exactly. About two, three months later, he calls me and says, hey, we need to switch from drug XYZ because it quit working. I said, what did you do? He said, well, my, my cattle buyer from Tennessee called, and he had these four-weight bulls, and he said the price was so good, I and mean, it was just like crack cocaine. He couldn't stay away from them, and he bought them, and in they come, and guess what? The drug quit working, right? So in weight is a, is a big issue. Commingling and transportation. We bought the, the uh, back tag scanner. If you look at a back tag, you can get the state and the sale barn on the back tag. And when I bought this when I was at Cactus, because we were buying, I don't know, 25,000 head of those kind of calves a week, I started scanning them coming in, and it was not uncommon to have cattle on one load from 32 different sale barns in five different states. That's pretty commingled, okay? And, and then we, we truck them, right? We used to think of a local cattle being you know, within 30 or 50 miles. Today, anything within eight hours is local cattle. And so we've really stretched the bounds of what we put cattle through transportation-wise that I think we really need to start rethinking. And if we're going to do this, we're going to have to change our trailers. We're gonna, I have people that are deep bedding trailers in the winter when we're bringing cattle from California to feed them in Dodge City and they're little thin skin things going over the Sierra Nevadas coming into our yards into a snowstorm and 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 so and then we think about if you think about transportation the one that's really getting me right now in our industry is how far we ship fat cattle when you're passing cattle coming on 56 and 50 that empty trucks are going back to to sioux county iowa because they're killing cattle in dodge city and liberal it's unbelievable how far we're shipping uh fats in this country Obviously, we've had some issues with the plant down in Garden City, but hot weather on trucks kills fat cattle and makes, causes problems at the plant. Cold weather on trucks causes us issues with lightweight calves in bringing them in. We spend a lot of time on receiving calves, warming cattle up, not with feed, but with bedding after they've been long hauled and been exposed to, to cold stress. And then lastly, one of the things that we struggle with we have the co-mingling in the sale barns, but if it takes you longer than a week to build a pen, we just saw a great paper on, on how metaphylaxis and vaccines work, and, and really what we're doing is buying time for that seven to 10 days for the calves that are weak to build their immune response or at least get the energy back so that they can build an immune response. So if we can cut disease pressure during that first seven to 10 days, we really get a stronger set of calves that can be exposed to more and weather the storm. But if we keep adding on those cattle in the pen, and we go and we buy a few this week, and we buy some the next week, and we keep adding on, we keep extending out that point of vulnerability within that pen, and we will have a wreck coming. Our data showed in millions of head of cattle that if it takes us longer than five to seven days to build a pen, you will almost double your chances of a BRD uh, wreck. 
BBD is something that I think a lot of people have talked about, but this one is one that will spike morbidity and have an effect on our case fatality rate. One percent of the cattle in the U.S. are born persistently infected with BVD, meaning that they recognize BVD as themselves and they have it coming out of every orifice in their body when they come into your facility, okay? Half of these calves, half of the BVD PI calves die before weaning, so they die before they leave the ranch. So meaning, into our stalker operations, we have about a half percent of our population of calves coming in are persistently infected with BVD and they're that Trojan horse that's spreading disease out around the facility. That, that said, um, when we looked at, at uh, half percent doesn't sound like much, but if you have 100 head pins and you have a half percent um, prevalence, every other pin is going to have a BVDPI in it. And that means more to me than probably the number of the percent cattle. It's every other pin or every fourth pin has a BVDPI, and, and proper vaccination helps us prevent that. Um, this isn't a big deal, but, but it does show that these cattle are overrepresented in the deads and the railers in your facility. About 10x what it is on the prevalence coming in. Four to three to four percent of your deads or railers are persistently infected. So, one percent of the cattle born in the U.S. are persistently infected with BVD. Half of those die on the ranch, and then once they get to the feed yard, half of the BVD PIs that arrive at the feed yard will die or be railed before they go to the shipping. So. 0.25% of our population are BVD PIs and they make it all the way from conception to consumption. Okay, this is what BVD does to the white blood cell count of a calf. The yellow bar are the ones that we vaccinated properly before they were exposed to BVD from a PI. The red bar is the white blood cell count in the cattle that were exposed to a BVD PI and weren't vaccinated it absolutely craters the white blood cell count. What happens if you don't have white blood cells and you're trying to fight off a bacterial infection? You die, okay? And that's, and that's, what, that's what we see in some of the biggest wrecks. Type two BVD um, seems to be more pathogenic when we get into these big BRD outbreaks, but type 1A, type 1B, uh, different things to that we will see as issues. One of the things I was really uh, interested in was seeing what crews, because what I did was I went and I ear notched cattle and I didn't tell people in the feed yards, we did, I don't know, probably 20,000 head. I didn't tell them whether the calves were BVD PI positive or not, and we just went about our business because I wanted to see what our pen riders identified those cattle as. And what we found was that many of the PI calves are pulled for coccidiosis. Okay, that's what the pen riders called it because they had bloody diarrhea. So we pull them for coxy, not knowing that they're a BVD PI, and then we'd run them through the chute five days in a row for coccidiosis, giving a man prolem, right, or co-rid drench. The last animal I want to run through my chute five days in a row is a BVD PI, <laughs> but that's what we wind up doing. So we have more research to, to do on, on that. One of the things, one of the papers I just read, if you don't vaccinate properly in your cow herd and you have a BVDPI in your pregnant, if you don't change gloves, the blood from, the, from one glove to the next, if the cows and heifers aren't vaccinated properly, you can spread BVD from a, from a, a palpation glove. Now I hear people say, well, I'm not going to change my glove, These, you know, and you're sitting there, you've seen the vet when they're pregnant or somebody standing there like this, I just say, you know, what if you went into your, for your annual physical and your doctor was standing there like this and said, hey, don't mind me, I'm just going to save a little bit on gloves. I said, I guarantee you all have the 8 o'clock appointment the next time you go in. We can do this. Processing is not a timed event. Um, we, we, uh, it's a quality event, not a quantity event, and, and we give the calves an hour to rest for every hour that they're on the truck. So long-haul cattle, we wait a day. Short haul cattle, if they come in and overnight, we might process them later that day, but 
pretty much we give everything a day to get something to drink and, and that. When we ask about vaccines, high-risk calves versus low-risk calves, I just circled this for you because I'm not going to go through all these numbers. The big thing is, is that we give them a modified live five-way type 1 and type 2 BVD. We will give them a black leg and, and we recommend a Mannheimia vaccine. The difference between high risk and low risk is, is that we won't use the, the Bactern in those calves, okay? So, so on the Clostridial, we'll have people say, well, I'm not, if you ban calves, you definitely need to give a tetanus toxoid to prevent tetanus. And on the black leg, I hear people say, well, I'm not gonna give a tetanus because we don't have any problem. I've been involved in three black leg outbreak in grow yards in Kansas. It's not pretty. But I have never been involved with a black leg outbreak in a grow yard that vaccinated for black leg. <laughs> it works, okay? All three cases, I was brought in as an expert witness by the veterinarian to defend them for not recommending the vaccination with black leg. And I said, I don't think you want me <laughs> to take the stand because I feel we should just vaccinate. Metaphylaxis, the use of mass treatment coming off the truck, decreases our, our morbidity by 50%. So if you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, if I give these calves, if I mass treat this group of calves, all the literature out there, we just saw another paper at AABP last week in St. Louis, but if you mass treat with an antibiotic, pick one, you will decrease morbidity 50%. It also decreases mortality. But the one thing, if you're expecting 40% pull rates, you'll have 20 if you mass treat on arrival. If you're expecting 20% pull rates, you'll have 10. So you can use that in your break-even spreadsheets to estimate. Um, but there's a lot of things that go into that, right? Weather, do I have enough labor? Do I have enough, uh, you know, the value of the calves, the weight of the calves, all of that goes into that decision of being able to economically pull the trigger on metaphylaxis. This is some data, you can't read it, but it's something that the jury's still out on, but I wanted to tell you, this Zelnate is a new immunomodulator that's out on the market, and we're starting to put it into a lot of cattle, but, but what I wanna point to is number one, it does not have any impact on, when it's given at processing, it has no impact on morbidity. What it does is it stimulates the innate immune system to fight off disease. So what they have seen in six studies, one done in Idaho, Texas, Kansas, Idaho, Colorado, Nebraska, some of, the first one was a 60-day trial and the rest of them were to close out and it was different types of cattle, but here you can see these were uh, high-risk 625 steers, high-risk 625 heifers, Holstein calves weighing 350 pounds, auction-derived heifers, auction-derived steers. The thing that was consistent was the decrease in the death loss. So the top one is the control versus the bottom number is the control plus, plus Zelnate. And we went from 1.5% death loss to 1.3, 4.8 to 6.2, 5.6 to 3, 4.3, 4.9 to 4. You get the study here, 8.2 to 5.9. And at the end of the day, when you look at all of these, every study responded the same to death loss. It was an average of 20% decrease in death loss with no impact on morbidity in all six studies. We're doing a bunch more studies right now and we've got it in, in thousands of cattle across the state of Kansas and we'll have more to, to report. On case fatality rate, the first thing is, can we find sick cattle? And this is, these are studies that have been done that look at lung scores at slaughter. And you can see here that cattle that were treated for BRD, 78% had lung lesions. The ones that weren't treated, 68% had lung lesions. Uh, 44 had lung lesions in the treated calves treated for BRD versus 42% that weren't treated. In other words, we have just as many lung lesions in cattle we don't treat as we do in the cattle that we, that we do and we still have trouble finding and identifying sick cattle. One of those reasons that I think it, that is, is not good for our industry is that we're seeing an undomestication of our cow herd. And what I mean by that is the cattle are, are getting wilder. We have, now we feed cattle, when we go out to feed the cows, we have big bales on flatbed trucks, right? And we get out long enough to cut the bale wrap, 
and we unroll it and we drive off. And then we have fence line bunks, so we pull up with the tractor and the mixer wagon and we feed in the fence line bunks and the cattle don't know what's in the tractor. And then when we doctor one these days out on pasture, how do we do it? We shoot them, right? We're shooting them with a gun. And so if there's not a hay bale on the flatbed and they see you coming across the cattle guard, they're like, oh crap, somebody's getting shot today. Right? They're out of here. And, and so when you talk to people at sale barns, you talk to people receiving calves, this docility score is important because if cattle don't trust you as a human being, if they think you're a coyote, they will hide their so clinical signs. So we spend a lot of time in our feed yards and backgrounding operations acclimating cattle to human beings. And so when they get in there, you have to, some cattle, they, they, you're in their flight zone when you just get to work in the morning, right? They see you and they're like, I don't know what to do. You have to start working with those cattle from a further distance. And then as you start to calm the cattle and get them used to you, there's a couple of ways that we acclimate cattle that are somewhat calm in the pen. We'll just put them in the corner of the pen and I'll just start moving them in line to the next corner and stop them, move them in a line to the next quarter. And I'll do that around the pen and, you know, for about a week. It takes me 10, 15 minutes. Another way that we do it is we'll just take them out of the pen and bring them back. Now this isn't, we're not trying to run them and exercise them, okay? This is, we're trying to train the cattle to respond. Number one, I am their friend. And number two, I will give you cues on what I want you to do. Cattle crave our attention. They're begging us to tell them, what do you want me to do? And if you'll spend time, you don't walk up to this horse and just jump on its back, do you? Have you ever seen a dog that's been mistreated? What does that dog do when you come in? It either wets the floor or it bites you, right? Cattle aren't any different. How about people that have been mistreated? Cattle have to understand we're there for them. When they do, they let their guard down and they say, hey, um, Tom, I'm sick. You mind taking me up to the hospital and let me, you know, let's find out what I got, get me treated and bring me back. But when, when they do that and, 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 and you have cattle acclimated, it's, it's absolutely poetry in motion. This is another thing that is, if cattle aren't eating a percent and a half by t a week and a half on feed, a wreck is coming. And, I mean, a percent and a half of their body weight. And, and this hay truck is a phenomenal tool to get cattle stimulated eating. Um, but uh, I also use this hay truck to pull sick cattle. If you have somebody new that's not been riding pins for a long time, if you'll have them ride pins while we put the hay out or while we put that first feeding out, they'll pull sick cattle, not just ugly cattle, okay? And so those are the types of things and, and tricks. But this one right here, this number looks like a pretty simple deal. Todd Milton gave me this, and this is done on probably 10 million head of cattle, and they could predict BRD wrecks if the cattle weren't eating a percent and a half of their body weight by a week and a half on feed, a wreck was coming. As far as pin space goes, one load pins are the best size because I don't have to co-mingle anything once they get to the yard. I can just unload them and put them in there, and I don't have to worry about two or three groups going together. The other one is I have people ask me about how much bunk space and Dale is doing, and Dale and AJ are doing some phenomenal research on bunk space, and, and you really need to talk to them about it. But when I go to a yard that it doesn't have the management, I say, just make sure all the calves can get to the bunk at once. That's my goal for bunk space. I don't measure it and do things like that, but I make sure all the cattle can get to the bunk. Pen, people and labor is 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 extremely important and and we asked uh, feed yards how many people do you need to carry out different tasks and when we asked them about riding pins they said one pin rider could cover about 2700 head of high-risk calves and when we asked them about low risk the feed yard managers and veterinarians said well they can you can handle about twice as many low-risk calves as you can high-risk calves okay so when I'm looking at one of the things I look at when I go in the yard, do we have enough help? If we're out there doctoring using the headlights of the pickup at night, 
then we probably don't have enough help or we're not getting started early enough in the day. But, but pen riders, it, one pen rider per 2,700 head of high risk, one pen rider per 5,000 head of low risk cattle. When you get to doctoring, one doctor can handle about 7,000 head of high risk calves. And again, it's just about twice as many people are needed, or I'm sorry, about twice as many cattle can be handled by one doctor when you go from high risk to low risk, low risk not needing as many people. When we ask people um, how uh, often should you ride pins, the white bar is high risk and, and the green bar is low risk. Most people want to ride high risk calves twice a day. And I'm, I really don't prescribe to that. I, I want to ride through those calves once really, really well. If I'm having trouble with a pin, I might go back. But for the most part, if, if I get through that pin and I find those calves, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to try to concentrate. The difference between a good pen rider and a great pen rider is effort and concentration. Staying hooked all day while you're on that horse or all morning while you're on that horse. I told one guy, he's like, well, they got to concentrate better. And they had one pen rider per 4,000 head. And I said, have you ever tried to look at 4,000 anything in a morning? I mean, we really got to think about what we're asking people to do. And, and how we're asking them to identify these sick cattle. And, and get, if you are going to ride cattle twice in weather like this, you need to start early because you have to get through those, that pen the second time before the heat of the day. Because if you don't, all the cattle look like they need pulled at about 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? So those are some things that, that we talk about. As far as in the chute and examining cattle when they get there, I'm still a thir firm believer in using a, a thermometer, and I have some things. I, I love, I miss Dr. Dan Upson dearly. He was a mentor for me, but it would always embarrass me as a professor at the veterinary school, and I knew he was going to ask this question. We'd start having a seminar about something, and he'd go to the students, what's the normal rectal temperature of the bovine? And our senior almost to be doctors would be sitting there like porky pig. I mean, they could diagnose whatever in a zebra in whatever, and they'd sit there and go, um, I don't know. And I'd be like, oh. So we hammer this home on, on, on that, and I have a slide coming up on this. But the clinical signs that I'm going to look for in a pen on a sick calf, sunken flanks. If they're not eating, something's wrong. And it might be a social problem in the pen. But whatever it is, that calf's not thriving. And I need to get it up there. I need to check it in the chute, do a proper physical exam. And maybe I need to put it in a hospital pen where it just gets some hay in its belly or some water before I put it back in there with its buddies. It might be homesick. I, eyes tell me a lot. If the eyes are dull and the eyes are sunken, and, and we just went through this because we have a yard that's bringing in a whole bunch of little calves. And if you look at what the dairy industry has done on diagnosing bovine respiratory disease in, in lightweight Holsteins, they now have a scoring system. And it's not just sunken eyes, but if you start to see mucus in the corner of the eyes, that's pretty negative on the health of that animal and you need to pull it out. If you start to see, I used to just write off the nasal discharge. Well, the combination of nasal discharge with discharge out of the eye or a dropped ear means we got to get ahead of this. And so the eyes, the ears, um, the, the nose. A moist nose is good, right? A dry nose at the shoot is bad. It's like us getting chapped lips. You know, when you start getting chapped lips, you're like, well, I'm getting sick. It's the same deal with a calf. And so when you start to learn and use the power of observation to look at those, the, the sunken eyes, the dull eyes, the dry nose, along with an animal that's not eating, we get it in there, then we can start to use some of our gizmos, such as the, the rectal temp and, and auscultating the lungs. Normal rectal temp, if you're going to use the thermometer, is 101.5 to 103.5 for feeder calves. Okay? When we, and we always round up to 104 for our treatment triggers and different things like that. I can tell you this, that if you have a calf that temps under 101, that temps like 99, that's not good. Okay, that one's headed towards ground temp. Okay, if they, if they temp 104 or higher, now I can start thinking about this is some sort of bacterial or viral disease that's increasing this, the rectal temp of this animal. And when I, 
um, and pulling triggers on, on doctrine. Now, days like today, and probably not today because we have a good breeze, but cattle will accumulate heat in their body. And we learned this on a group of calves uh, over by Wamego. We had some seven weights that came in. It was six in the morning. We go to work them. We put the thermometer in them. The first one temped 107. I go, oh, my goodness. And these cattle were straightened out. Next one came in 106. The next one came in 107. The next one was 108. So I just told the grad students, I said, y'all got a bad thermometer. We worked those calves again the next day because this project was three days in a row. They brought four thermometers. Had them set out. And it was O dark 30, and we started working them. It was cool. And again, they tempt hot. The next night, we got a rain on their back. Those cattle, it, the temperature dropped 20 degrees the day before. Those cattle came in 101, 102, 101. It is absolutely amazing how much heat lightweight calves can accumulate in this type of, in this type of environment with humidity, increased ambient temperature, and decreased wind speed. Okay, so it's something that you have to understand. I just had my first case of, of actual sunburn in cattle. And uh, I didn't find that out until we got the leather samples back that it was actually sunburn. So there's a new one coming for us. But anyway, respiration rates normal is one, uh, 10 to 40 breaths per minute. When you start to see cattle increase respiratory rate, you can, and it's not hot out, that's when I start thinking respiratory disease or acidosis. But in heat stress, this is one of the first clinical signs of calves not being able to cope. They start to flare their nostrils, they increase their, their uh, labored breathing, and then they start to get slobber. And then once they get slobbered, the next stage is open mouth breathing, okay? But, but this is normal. Normal heart rate, 60 to 80, and then rumen contractions, one to two per minute. And people are like, well, how am I gonna measure that? If you have a stethoscope, you can put it on there and you can hear them. But Dr. Epson taught us that if you just take your fist and you put that in that paralumbar fossa, you can hold your fist there and you can feel that rumen contract and move underneath your fist. So you can measure rumen contractions with nothing but, but a stub. I'll wrap up with a couple of slides. And Dale will be glad to, with the hot weather to get us uh, done a little bit earlier. But here are some common questions I get about antibiotics. Okay. The first one is, is you know, I, when I moved to Texas to start doing veterinary work, everybody gave an animal drug X and a pin kicker. And I'm like, what the heck's a pin kicker? Well, it's penicillin. So they'd give it whatever drug plus a pin kicker. And this and a pin kicker. We got to give them a pin kicker. I'm like, no, we're going to stop doing that because none of our antibiotics have been approved by the FDA for combination use. They are all approved for single drug use. And the drugs that we have are highly effective. And, and when we sometimes, when we use drugs in combination, let's say one drug might be bactericidal and the other one's bacteriostatic, they will actually interfere with the other one being able to work. So you can do more damage than good by giving two drugs at the same time to cattle. How long should I wait to treat again? The answer to that is, I really don't know. I do know this. On average, re cattle for retreatment of bovine respiratory disease come in 11 to 14 days after the first treatment. Okay? So we don't have anything that has a moratorium longer than seven days. So I don't care. Okay? Here's the other deal. If I have a calf that I'm treating day one, day three, day five, I don't buy a big bag of feed for that one because it's not responding. And, and so, so you can go ahead, it makes me feel better. And of course, when I own them, I'm like, treat that calf, you know? It's hard not to, but it's a $20 bill or $30 bill coming out of your pocket every time we, we do that. So I would, if I'm using a drug that has a long moratorium, I'm gonna let that moratorium go out because I have drugs on board. Then when that comes off, I'll treat a second or a third time. I don't treat a fourth time uh, for, for BRD. When should you switch to the next drug? So I give the first drug. When do I switch to the second drug? The, I don't know the answer to that one either, except for this. We used to switch drugs, go from one drug, you know, we'd have first treatment, second treatment, third treatment, being three different drugs. And I'll just be honest with you. 
Um, I had a feed yard that couldn't keep them straight. They, you know, they'd do the first one on the third one or have them mixed up, and I said, that's it. We're just going to go to one drug. I'm not going to tell you what drug it was, but we're just going to go to one. If you pull it once, use that drug. You pull it twice, use the same drug. You pull it three times, it's all we got. And I was an executive. I wasn't just a veterinarian, so we could make some of those decisions. Our case fatality rate didn't change a bit. Using one drug every time versus using doing all my hocus-pocus smokes and mirrors as a veterinarian and using my big brain, it didn't matter. It was how soon we pull them. It was how quick we get them treated and, and that. And, and so the reason then why I switched to use drug one and drug two and drug three is that if I spread the wealth around, I got to go on three fishing trips rather than just one. Um, the root of delivery and speed of infection, okay? When we, I hear people say, well, I'm going to vein it because it's going to get there faster. That is false. If you, when we use things sub-Q and we use some of our modern drugs, they get to the site of infection within 40 minutes. That's absolutely amazing. If you vein it, it's, it might get there a 30 seconds sooner, okay? But Doc here in the front row will tell you that isn't going to matter a bit, is it? Right. So, so use it sub-Q, don't vein so the other question is if I can use some of these drugs at a lower dose three days in a row versus a big dose once. Always use the big dose once. And there's two reasons for that. One, I've done the studies looking at one dose, let's say, let's use um, Batril or Nuflor as an example. Both of them have the same thing. You can give one dose and wait 72 hours or you can give three lower doses, okay? When we went to the three lower doses, we had twice the case fatality rate than we did of giving it once at the bigger dose. Cattle are like us. If you're sick and you go to the doctor, he says, well, we got two plans of action here. One, we can give you the big dose and you can go home and you can just stay there and you don't have to come back in. The other option is I can give you a lower dose three days in a row. You got to come in three days and by the way, it's twice the likelihood you're going to die. Okay? Which one are you going to pick? So that's the one we pick. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I think that at the end of the day, with antibiotics, again, we'll have about an 80% success rate on one treatment, on our first treatment, and then 50% success on the second, and 50% success on the third. 10% case fatality rate. At the end of the day, nothing makes up for, for um, animal husbandry. And the most abused pens on the feed yard are the hospital pens. We design these beautiful feeding pens, and then we say, we get done, we say, oh, hey, we need to put a hospital in there. And you're like, yeah, let's put it down there in the corner by the lagoon. And, may, and it's, it winds up being a triangle pen, right? And all the different things that you don't want, and the bunk's too short and we put a windbreak up that doesn't come down, so all the cattle, it's like a death trap, not a hospital pen. These hospital pens, if you're gonna have one, you need to maintain it just like it was a feeding pen or even better. How much pen space do you need? As much pen space as you allow cattle in the rest of the, the grow yard. And the last pens I should ever fill are the pens next to your hospital pens. And everybody says, oh yeah, that's for biosecurity. Yes. But it's also because if I run out of space in my hospital pens, I can overflow into the pen next to it. That's what I'm always hedging on to improve my case outcomes. Space in those hospital pens is, is hugely important. If there was one place I was going to put shades on a facility, it'd be on where I have cattle that are recovering from respiratory disease. If there was a place that I was going to put a windbreak up in the winter, it would be for those cattle that need the TLC the cleanest water tanks, the freshest feed. And that makes a huge, huge difference. What I get in trouble with right now is people not using any hospital pens. And they want to get those cattle, they want to doctor them and put them all back, and they don't have the management or enough people power. And they can't keep track of what they doctored yesterday or what they doctored two days ago or three days ago. And, and these cattle are getting run around all around the feed yard, and it's just, it's, it's, it's bad. I don't have an antibiotic that fixes this, right? 
um, or this kind of water tank and, and things of like that. I found these pictures on the web. That's a pretty young Dr. Dale there. It's not? Well, your hair's a lot grayer here than it was there. <laughs> but um, this is one of the gems of our department, the stalker unit, and it's one of the gems of our university, and it's because of the unselfishness of Dale Blasey. And let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> 